Hey guys, I'm Joe, this is Theo Joe Tech, and with me I have the LG V10. This is the first of LG's new V series phones, and you're gonna get some interesting features that you're not gonna see in any other phone. I've got quite a bit to say about this, so let's take a look. Now, I actually got this phone through an early trial program from LG for a chance to review it, so full disclosure, I didn't actually pay for the phone, but obviously, I'm gonna give a completely honest and unbiased review. I'm gonna tell you what I do like, what I don't like, and everything in between. First, let's take a look at the front of the phone. The first thing you'll probably notice, which sets this phone apart from pretty much everyone else, is the second screen. It's a little screen at the top right in addition to the main screen, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit. But as for the main screen, it is 5.7 inches. Now this is a big screen. Compared to the G4, it doesn't really look that much bigger, but somehow it feels huge. I've never had a phone this big before, and with my small hands, it definitely takes getting used to, especially when I have to go to reach something at the top of the screen. I have to basically readjust how I'm holding in my hand to get all the way up there. The screen is a quad HD display. That's 2560 by 1440, and at this size, that makes it 513 pixels per inch. This is an extremely high pixel density. For comparison, the iPhone 6S Plus is only about 400 101 pixels per inch. And I gotta say, this screen is awesome when looking at high resolution pictures and videos. It's freakishly sharp, and the contrast and colors are great too. This display actually uses the same quantum IPS type display as the LG G4, so compared to regular LCD, it boasts 25% better brightness and color, and I'm assuming based on the fact that it's the same type of display, that it's gonna have the same 98% DCI color space coverage that the G4 had. The DCI color space is what they use for movies, so that's really great if you're gonna be watching movies on the phone. Now let's get to the second screen. It's basically tacked on top of the main screen. It's 2.1 inches, 160 by 1040 pixels, making it also 513 pixels per inch. When the phone's off, it just shows you some basic info like date, time, battery, and even a little weather symbol. And it seems to only pull the weather from your current location setting in the LG weather app. The screen will also show some notification symbols for different apps if you get a notification, so it basically replaces any little notification light. When the main screen's off, you can also swipe over to reveal some basic toggles like vibrate, Wi-Fi, flashlight, and even activate camera. And the screen is deactivated by the proximity sensor, so if it's in your pocket or something, it's not like it's gonna be on literally all the time. When the main screen's on, it will show you one of two screens that you can swipe between, either some text called a signature where you put your name and you can have a few font selections, or a set of five app shortcuts that you can drag and drop any app onto. What I really like about the second screen is that new notifications come through that instead of popping up and blocking whatever is on your main screen. So it just keeps notifications out of the way, which is really nice. I don't really find myself using the second screen for shortcuts that often, mostly because I have to reach all the way to the top of an already pretty big screen. So I think it's usually easier for me to just put my most common apps at the bottom near my thumb, but I do like that you can get notifications and easy access to information up there. All right, so now that we talked about the screens, let's talk about the other big feature on the front of the phone, the two cameras. And you're probably wondering why you would need to have two cameras on the front. Well, it's basically to make it easier to take selfies. In the camera app, you basically select between a regular 80 degree field of view or a wider 120 degree view. And it seems like this is accomplished by just having one lens that's wide angle and the other that's not. Either way, the lens works as intended and it lets you get multiple people into a group without having ridiculously long arms or having to cut people out. Each of the dual cameras captures five megapixels at 2560 by 1440. That being said, I've definitely noticed a lower quality in the wide angle images. So I would say if you can get away with using the non-wide angle, then that's probably the way to go. Then again, most people probably don't really care about selfie quality anyway. Now let's take a look at the edges of the phone. At the bottom, you're gonna find a micro USB for charging and it does support Qualcomm Quick Charge 2.0. This is an awesome feature that I really think should be in all phones just because it's so useful. You can charge the phone 50% in 40 minutes, which is great for topping off the phone or if you forget to charge it, or if you just hate waiting. You just have to make sure you get a charger that supports quick charge. At the bottom, you're also going to find a headphone jack, a microphone, a speaker, and I actually prefer this placement of the speaker definitely over the back like it was on the G4. At the top of the phone, you're gonna find an IR blaster, 
which you can use with LG's controller app. This is a nice addition if you have a lot of controllers for your TVs or whatever devices, you can use your phone in a pinch to control them. Also at the top is what appears to be a second microphone. This would make sense for the bi-directional audio recording that I'm going to get to later in the review. The sides of the phone are flanked by what LG calls a DoraGuard frame. It's basically made up of 316L stainless steel and the bottom and back have this Dora skin for a drop resilience. Dora skin is basically this soft plastic. It's kind of nice to the touch to feel and I could see how this would absorb shocks from a drop or something. It's just a little bit softer than hard plastic you might be used to. That being said, I think you probably still would want to get a case in case you drop it on concrete or something like that. Next, let's move on to the back. The first thing you'll probably notice is the diamond texture pattern. I'm a huge fan of this texture. It really feels nice and is easy to grip onto, and it definitely looks cool as well. Also on the back near the top, you're gonna find the camera along with the flash, a laser autofocus system, and a color spectrum analyzer, but you'll also find the power and volume buttons. Yes, the power button is on the back of the phone. Now, the power button actually doubles as a fingerprint scanner for the lock screen. I found that it definitely works well and is pretty much instant, and depending on the positions you use to scan in your finger, it can even read it at weird angles when you're holding your phone. And even though the placement of the power button is unusual compared to other phones, it definitely feels natural to put your finger there, so even if you're not used to it, you probably shouldn't have a problem with it. Also, right above and below the power button are the volume buttons, so you never really have to move your finger very far. The volume buttons have this really cool texture. It kind of feels rough, but in a good way. I do like how it feels. It's very grippy, even though it's just for your finger. Also on the back, of course, you can't forget about the primary camera. This is actually the same camera that was in the LG G4, and it really is a beast for a phone camera. It's 16 megapixels with an f1.8 aperture lens and a bunch of other cool manual features that I'm going to get to. Now to the right of the camera you have the laser autofocus system. This is just to measure distance so it's easier for the camera to figure out where to focus. And it's kind of interesting when the camera is active you can actually see the lasers flashing so I guess you know it's working. Now on the other side you have the flash obviously and then a color spectrum analyzer. Now the purpose of this is to accurately measure white balance and I found it works pretty well especially in weird color situations such as having mixed color temperatures it seems to get the job done. I'm gonna go into more detail about the camera performance in a bit but that's gonna take some time so let me first finish talking about the physical features of the phone. Another big feature which is probably the simplest is just a removable back. This is gonna give you access to the replaceable 3000 milliamp hour battery, a nano sim slot, and a micro SD expandable storage slot. And the expandable storage will take whatever size card you throw at it. It says it can support up to two terabyte micro SD cards, but those don't even exist yet. But you'll definitely want a fast SD card, probably at least UHS-1, but if you're gonna be doing 4K recording, you're really gonna need UHS-3 for the highest bit rate. I'm actually using a 64 gigabyte SanDisk Extreme Pro, which is UHS-3, and this handles the 4K high bit rate fine. I'll put a link to that card in the description if you need an idea for what to get. Also on the back cover, we come to what I think is probably my only major gripe with this phone. We can see that there's an NFC sticker, but there is no QI wireless charging, which for me is a big bummer, especially because at night in bed, I just like to put my phone on a wireless charger. I don't wanna have to be fumbling about to try and plug the cable in. It's just really convenient to have wireless charging, and I don't know why they wouldn't put that in. But there is hope, because you can see an additional two pins, which I believe are for the ability to add a wireless charging sticker later. In the case of my G4, I actually was able to buy a third-party NFC Plus wireless charging sticker that you can add on afterwards. So if we end up being able to add a wireless charging sticker later, then all right, that's not a big deal. They're pretty cheap and easy to install, but it's definitely something to be aware of and check up on to see if you can get these stickers because at the time of this video, they don't make them yet. Now, before going over performance, I'm gonna quickly go over the internal specs that you can't see. The internal storage is 64 gigabytes, and that's actually a pretty good amount of storage even without the expandable storage. The processor is an 808 Snapdragon from Qualcomm, and we've got four gigabytes of LPDDR3 RAM of unknown frequency. It ships with Android 5.1.1 Lollipop and has LG's UX 4.0 skin, but you can probably expect to be able to upgrade it to Android 6.0 Marshmallow before long. In terms of connectivity, you got 802.11ac Wi-Fi, 
Bluetooth 4.1, and of course, NFC. Now let's get into performance, starting with the camera. This is definitely one of the main selling points of the phone, and with good reason. I think one of the best parts about the camera is the camera app, because in addition to the auto modes, you get manual modes for both stills and videos, and this is really where the camera shines. First, you can pretty much use the manual modes as auto mode if you don't wanna change any settings, but you can choose to individually enable manual control of things like white balance, manual focus, shutter speed, ISO if you want to. Another critical feature for the stills at least is the ability to capture raw images. This is a huge feature for anyone even remotely into photography. And the images pretty much look good right out of the camera. I was able to capture several test videos and images while I was golfing one day, so I can show you some of those. The phone definitely seems to do some processing behind the scenes. You can tell that the images are sharpened quite a bit and definitely undergo some noise reduction before being encoded into JPEG. Now this isn't a bad thing because most people don't want to worry about processing the photos, but I also noticed that the raw images all have some serious vignetting going on. It could be minimized with Lightroom's correction profile for the LG G4 since it's the same camera, but it would be really nice if LG would add a built-in profile to their raw images so you wouldn't have to even really worry about applying a custom lens correction profile. It's just something to keep in mind if you go to process your photos in RAW and you see a huge vignette, that's the reason for it. You just gotta apply a lens correction profile. All that being said, I'm definitely happy with the performance of this camera. The images are very impressive, especially considering it's on a phone and with such a small sensor. Now let's move on to the video features, which I'm especially excited about, again, because of the manual features. Now the V10 actually shoots 4K and they fixed my primary complaint that was with the G4, which was the low bit rate. So I'm really happy about that. So in addition to choosing the resolution and frame rate, you can also choose high, medium, or low bit rate. The highest bit rate for 4K is 64 megabits per second, which is awesome. That's more than double the G4's 30 megabits per second for the same resolution. And as a comparison, that's higher than the iPhone 6S 4K bitrate of 50 megabits per second, and I even thought that was pretty good. The bitrate at 1080p is also good with 24 megabits per second at 30 FPS, and at 60 frames per second at 1080p, you get 36 megabits per second. This is what I like to see, high bitrate with high resolution. You can put whatever resolution you want, but if it's not backed up by a high bitrate, it means nothing. So I'm really glad they implemented the changes and added some high bit rates for the video recording. And you can definitely see that it pays off in some of these videos I shot also while golfing. The detail pretty much remains in even some of the most fine parts of the video. Like in the still image mode, you can also set the white balance, manual focus, ISO, shutter speed, and there's also quite a bit of audio options as well. This includes mic boost or padding, wind reduction, and you can even adjust the directional sensitivity for the microphones to be either more forward or backward oriented. So for example, if you're recording something, but you're talking, you can actually focus it on your voice. This seems like a really useful feature that I don't think we've seen in any other phone yet. You can also select some stabilization, either optical or this steady mode. It's basically just a warp stabilizer. It's not available in 4K since I'm pretty sure what's going on is it's recording at a higher resolution and then cropping down to stabilize it. But I have found that the optical stabilization works reasonably well at least. I also like the fact that you can manually focus, but I would have liked to see the ability to change the focus and pull focus while you're filming. You can't really seem to do that. But overall, the videos definitely look great, especially with that high bit rate to retain the sharp detail. I also wanna talk about the high fidelity audio feature. Basically, this phone includes a 32-bit digital to analog audio converter. Now, this is nice and all, but unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to notice a difference. 32-bit has a place in recording music, especially for mixing, but for playback, the human ear can't even distinguish between 16 and 24-bit, let alone 32-bit. The human ear just doesn't have the dynamic range to hear it. It's kind of like saying if you have a TV that goes into the infrared and ultraviolet spectrum, it's great, it works, but you can't appreciate it. Also, you're probably not even gonna be able to find any 32-bit audio files anyway. But I will say that the earbuds that came with the phone are definitely good, so that's a plus. 
Finally, let's talk about actually using the phone, which is probably the most important thing. Now, this phone is definitely really snappy. Every app opens pretty much instantly. And as a pro tip, I personally like to go into the developer options and speed up the animations, which makes things look even faster. Now, I don't play games on my phone, but I downloaded a couple just to test them out, and they seem to run fine. I hadn't come across any stuttering or jittering at all. I also downloaded some benchmark apps, 3D Mark and Geekbench. In the 3D Mark Slingshot benchmark, it scored a 408 on OpenGL 3.1 but on OpenGL 3.0, it scored 1106. And on Geekbench, it scored a 719 for single core and 2764 on multi-core. So what exactly does that tell us? I don't know, I just threw it in there for you guys who might wanna know. Okay, so continuing with the interface, LG's UX skin actually has some cool little features that I definitely like. You got stuff like the mini view, which allows you to swipe across the home buttons and then it shrinks the screen to one corner so you can use the whole thing with just your thumb and not have to stretch, which is definitely helpful for me. You also have a clear all button for running apps, which is something I use all the time. And it also has some things called smart settings, which lets you perform certain tasks depending on certain conditions. For example, you can turn on or off Bluetooth when you leave home or turn on Wi-Fi when you arrive home. To the left of the home screen is the Smart Bulletin and you can customize it with different cards, a lot like the Google Now for the Nexus phones. Also, another little cool feature that I thought I would mention is that the lock screen will actually show rain based on the weather in your current location set in LG's weather app. As for battery life, it definitely seems to be great and especially if you're on Wi-Fi, you should have no problem having it last all day. And between having quick charge and the ability to have a spare battery, I think even the heaviest users should be happy with it. Overall, I really like this phone. It's probably gonna polarize people based on its size. Either you like a phone this huge or you don't. There's pretty much no middle ground. The performance on this one is definitely top notch. It runs smoothly, really snappy, and I've had very few instances where it would freeze up for a second, which is unlike the other Android phones I've used that every once in a while, it would definitely just stop responding. I really haven't had that too many times on this phone. The camera again really shines and I'm really impressed especially with the video options they put into this one. And as I said before, the only improvement I could see for the camera is to add those lens correction profiles to the DNG files, which would allow people to more easily process the raw files to the highest quality. If you're someone who likes photography and taking videos, especially if you like to do some post-processing, I really think this phone is as good as you can get at the moment. And the only other thing I'm hoping to see are those QI stickers, either third party or official, because for me, QI wireless charging is really a big deal and I'd like to see that added. But besides that, I really don't have any other complaints about the phone. It's definitely a good phone and I think it's worth taking a look at. So that is really all I have to say about the LG V10. If you guys have any thoughts in the comments section, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you guys or if you wanna hit me up on Twitter, I'll be on there as well. And if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Give it a thumbs up so I know you guys liked it. If you wanna continue watching, I've got some other videos on the right hand side, such as the unboxing for the V10. So you can either click those or look in the description for the same link, like if you're on a phone. If you wanna subscribe, I make new videos three times a week, so I think it should be worth it. So thanks for watching guys. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I will see you next time. Have a good one.